Now, Rob Wilson is our speaker tonight. He's Professor of Environmental Earth Science at the University of St Andrews. He uses tree rings to understand environmental change with a particular emphasis on reconstructing past climate. As well as using tree rings, he also dabbles in using corals and uh, searches historical archives too. He does field work all over the world, but he tells me that he can be found in Scotland in the summer, running through the highlands with a tree corer in hand, looking for good Scots pine trees and also for um, old, for sub fossil deposits in bogs and lakes. So over to Rob now. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Julia. Um, well, this is, uh, <coughs> uh, well, thank you for all sitting on your own chairs at, at your home and uh, logging on. Uh, it's a very weird way of lecturing, so I assume there are people there. Um, so um, today's lecture um, was actually a, basically a, a lecture that I had started putting together actually almost a year ago. Um, that's why the contentious title is there. It's a paper that just got published just over a year ago now um, that will be a part of the talk, but not a dominant part of the talk, to be honest. Um, uh, but really what I'm presenting today is the work that I've been doing in Scotland for the last uh, 13, 14 years or so. Um, and this is an ongoing project. So this is kind of the, the state of the project um, and finishing off with some uh, future directions where we hope or we are going. Um, so Julia's already uh, introduced me very nicely. So um, I, I, um, I define myself as a paleoclimatologist, uh, really focusing on, on studying past climate change and, and past climate dynamics. And tree rings are predominantly uh, my archives of choice. So I, I call myself a dendro climatologist. Um, now, for the sake of this talk today, I'm going to be honest right from the beginning that I'm not a botanist in any way. And in fact, I would, uh, or with all my colleagues, I very much, um, I might be slightly flippant here, but ecology and all the ecological signals that many people are listening to this talk are probably interested in. This is noise. OK, it's the ecology that it mucks up my archive for, for extracting a climate signal. Now, having said that, uh, 13 years of work in Scotland has given me appreciation of the importance of ecology in forest ecosystems. Um, so I, I am also an ecological convert um, uh, over the last decade or so, mainly because um, the human impact um, and the human disturbance on the woodlands of, of, of Scotland is quite profound and we needed to cater for such disturbance before we could actually use these archives uh, for climate. Um, so the talk today um, and uh, the top right hand corner is the number of slides, but some of these slides are like videos, so I don't panic. With it. Um, I'll try and keep this under the hour. Um, I'm first going to very briefly uh, contextualise climate change um, in Scotland and compare that to the Northern Hemisphere. I'm going to briefly talk about large scale climate change as well with regards to some of the work I do. Um, and Scotland is just one data point in, in the large global climate system. Um, and we need to keep that aware of what happens in Scotland may not represent the large scale system. Um, I also introduced the basics of dendrochronology and dendroclimatology, um, just giving you a veneer of what I do or how we go about it. Um, and then I'm really the bulk of this talk is, is, is going to be focused on the Scottish Pine Project. that has been um, ongoing for about 13 years. Um, how we sample living trees, how we extend the living archive using uh, preserved subfossil material, um, mainly from in this talk lakes, but I'll talk about bogs as well. Um, and then I'll I'll introduce the climate reconstructions we've developed to date. Um, but at the end, I also talk about um, the the potential for updates uh, in the near future. Um, and then I'll talk about the 17th century, which was a, a thoroughly miserable century to be living in Scotland, um, which ended with a profoundly um, uh, difficult period uh, leading up to the union with England. Um, and that's where the sort of the, the story about uh, the, the loss of independence comes into the whole story. And then finally, I'll talk about ongoing and future research with regards to the Pine Project and what I'm doing in Scotland. So. This is nothing new for all of us listening. Climate is changing. Uh, the IPCC uh, has 
got a very clear statement out at the moment amongst many scientists. Basically, a global warming of one and a half degrees relative to pre-industrial, so let's say before 1880 or before 1850, will likely lead to irreversible effects on the climate system and substantial human impacts on society. Um, so I, I want to put that in context here about when I'm talking about some of the changes uh, that we, we see both locally and we see in large scales um, is that we're on course for impacts on human society. Um, and although I'll be talking about the 17th century um, and the potential impacts on society at that point, that was a, a cooling effect and how that impacted climate where we are now thinking about a warming effect and how that might impact society in the future. So if we look at um, the Northern Hemisphere and I'm just looking at la annual land temperatures, um, this is a plot of temperature anomalies from 1880 up to present. Um, and these are anomalies relative to the mean um, of the last 20 years or so of the 19th century from 1880 to 1990. And we can see there's variability, but much of the increase in temperatures is in the last 40 years or so. Um, and the period from 2000 to 2019 is 1 1.5 degrees warmer than the tw last 20 years of the 19th century. So if we're looking at land only and annual temperatures for the Northern Hemisphere, and this is 30 degrees to 70 degrees north, so that's the sort of latitudinal band that I normally work with with regards to sort of conifer trees, um, then we're already at that sort of dangerous state that the IPCC has defined. Now, the reality is, is that actually climate is changing in a very heterogeneous way. So this is a spatial plot of change of the anomalies of the last 20 years or 1999 to 2019 relative to the last 20 years of the 19th century. And you can see that the warming is actually seen much more at the high latitudes of the Northern Hemisphere. This is a well-known feature called polar amplification. Scotland and the UK here is nestled in this sort of orangey colour. So we've seen change of about one to two degrees. Um, but you can see that for lower latitudes here where we might be at lower rates of change, um, but still increasing. So that's when the IPC is talking about a global change of one and a half degrees. That's why, you know, we've got to be a bit careful trying to understand the local scale of change, because if you're at higher latitudes, you're in, in continental interiors, those rates of changes are going to be much more profound than maybe lower latitudes and oceanic, oceanic environments. And then in Scotland, uh, this is again annual land temperatures for Scotland. Um, and since the uh, the last 20 years, relative to the last 20 years of the 19th century, we've seen about a 1.3 degree increase over that time. Um, and a sort of steady uh, warming from the 19th century up to the 1950s or so, a little bit of a cooling until the 70s, and then warming for the last 40 or 50 years or so. Um, so it's this kind of trend that I'm really focusing on in this talk about contextualising the recent climate change in Scotland over a longer time scale. How unique is it? Have there been periods in the past that may have been slightly warmer or not? So when we compare local, local Scottish temperatures to the Northern Hemisphere, um, we've got to be a bit careful about understanding these so-called dangerous levels of climate change of greater than one and a half degrees. This really does Rep represent in some depending where you are whether it's lesser or greater changes at the regional scale I mean if you're in the Alps or if you're in Alaska then um, temperatures are increasing at a much greater rate than we, we see in Scotland <clears throat> um, as well as at larger scales then we never need to understand the local scale changes okay it's the local scale regional climates that just as important rather than just look at these large scales uh, um, uh, studies as well now, we are quite lucky with regards to climate change in Scotland because the rate of change in Scotland is partly dampened by our proximity to the North Atlantic, where the rate of change um, is, is relatively modest. There's also a sort of cooling blue blob of sea surface temperatures just south of Greenland as well that's um, having a bit of an influence as well. So, you know, we're, we're not heading towards some dangerous state at this time, but it has still warmed by one. 1.3 degrees uh, the last 100 years or so and even a change of one degrees is going to have impacts on ecosystems and how we manage those ecosystems and if it's going to warm by another degree in the next 50 years then we need to prepare for that we need to understand how the 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 the, the, the natural systems are going to respond to that and maybe how we should manage those systems 
um, in a warming world and maybe a wetter world and a windier world as we could live in Scotland. So we need to place the recent climate uh, changes into a longer term context because the instrumental record is simply too short uh, to give us that sort of full spectrum of past climate variability. And to do that, we need so-called climate proxy archives. Um, it could be ice cores, lake sediments, stalagmites, historical documents, and of course tree rings, which is going to be the focus of today's talk. Um, so, as I said earlier, I define myself as a dendrochronologist or a dendroclimatologist, and essentially this is the science of dating tree ring archives, okay, getting an exact date of each of the rings, right, and then understanding the driving environmental factors that form those rings. Why are those rings wide? Why are they thin? Um, and, and that sort of thing. So it's understanding and in, in, interpreting the information that is extant within that archive. And that's the real challenge uh, in dendro uh, chronology. One of the great strengths of dendro chronology is the dating control that we have. Um, this is a schematic figure. Um, I've nicked it off some colleagues um, in, in the Swiss lab uh, in Zurich here. It's a beautiful uh, image here. So if you start on the right here, conceptually, we would sample um, living trees. We know the outer ring because that's the, the ring of the year we sample the trees. Um, and then we can then basically count the rings uh, going back in time and we can do a pseudo date uh, for the for those years. And then we can extend that living archive by then trying to find preserved timbers of the same species that had grown in roughly the same climate environment. So it was the same region and they be, these could be, be beams in buildings uh, going back in time or archaeological material or preserved in uh, river sediments, lake sediments, bogs and so forth. And as long as we are staying with the same species and roughly in the same environment where all the trees are responding in a similar way to the same environmental drivers, then we can pattern match the barcode of wide and thin rings between samples and bridge chronologies uh, going back in time, starting with living material, then historic material from buildings and then bogs and so forth. Um, using this process, it's called cross dating, um, we can we can build or dendrochronologists have built very, very long chronologies, the longest being the central European oak archive that goes back over 10,000 years now, a continuous record. Um, so it, it was one of my aims in life was to build a similar long record um, uh, for wherever I was living. So Scotland being there, we'll see how far I've got. So. Um, the next question is a, more of a conceptual thing is actually how do we tease out environmental or climatic information from treeing archives? OK, when you see a disc of wood, each disc of wood or each core from a tree has a unique story to that particular tree. But at the same time, embedded in that is a climate story, hopefully. Um, and how do we get that out? So um, this is just a very schematic um, uh, conceptual model. Um, representing here's a tree here and the growth of the tree is a basically an aggregated response to multiple factors in the environment at the very basic level. So I'm the climatologist, so hopefully there's a climate influence on growth. Now that could be temperature, it could be precipitation, et cetera, et cetera. It could be even groundwater conditions. Then we have what we would could call very simply uh, tree specific disturbance, so that's endogenous signals specific to the tree, so the tree could be hit by lightning or the neighbouring tree might die and fall down and be an opening in the canopy, so that tree will grow slightly quicker than the trees around it. And then you might have stand wide uh, disturbance impacts uh, that affect many trees in a, in a woodland or at least in a stand, so that could be fire, it could be insect attack, disease, pollution, management, any disturbance, including human disturbance. Okay. Now, I, me as a climatologist, I'm interested in the climate story that's extant in these archives, but you might be um, a, 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 you know, you might want to study pollution and so forth. The pollution is the signal of choice and actually then in that regard, the climate is the noise. OK, so it's, it's really understanding those different signals in these streaming archives that is really the skill to try and interpret, um, interpret uh, what you want to do with those different archives and the sampling is needs to be strategic depending on what you're trying to do. Um, very briefly, I just want to share that there is a wealth of information that we can measure from tree ring archives. 
Um, here we have some figures from conifer trees. Um, so, you know, spruce, pine and so forth. Um, and we have a ring width here. And this is just a micrograph image of a single ring. And you can see that we have an early wood here where the, 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 the wood is lighter colored. And actually the wood is light because there's not a lot of wood in there because it's mostly space in the cells. It's actually just a big, uh, you know, a, a large lumen the vacuole and the thing. And then as you get into the later, latter end of the year where growth is slowing down at the end of the summer and you're going into autumn, then the cell walls get thicker, and they get denser and the cells get um, smaller. So we can measure the ring width, we can measure the early wood width, we can measure the late wood width, and we can also measure the density through that ring. OK, and the late wood density, this peak and maximum late wood density is a very good proxy for summer temperatures at the end of the growing season. There is more and more now uh, uh, ways of me measuring other cell properties, the size of the lumen, the cell wall thicknesses and other wood property aspects within these archives. We can move to deciduous trees as well in a very similar way. This is just an oak example here. Again, we've got the full ring width here. We've got a very different wood structure here. So we've got these early wood vessels here, but you can still measure the early wood width, the late wood width, but you could also measure the vessel sizes and all sorts of stuff that you can measure in these archives. And then finally, you can look at the chemistry of the wood where you're looking at isotopes, oxygen and carbon being kind of the norm um, and then even elements, whether they're major or trace elements and all provide some aspect of information within the system. Now, what which of those parameters that are relevant to your study depends on what you're trying to do. So from a climatological point of view, with regards to trying to understand past temperatures or past precipitation, the metrics of choice are really ring width um, and density, especially for, for um, temperature, uh, but oxygen isotopes are pretty good for, for precipitation as well. And it really depends on the environment where we're sampling. So for this talk, I'm going to really focus on the ring width data and the density data that we measure from these archives. They're relatively quick and cheap to measure, and it means we can um, measure lots and lots of rings, lots and lots of trees, and lots and lots of sites, and we have a really rich data set for doing these studies that we want to do. So in 2007, when I got my uh, position, uh, started at St. Andrews, um, got my first lectureship, um, finally I could then start sort of thinking about creating a lab. Um, and because I was based in Scotland, um, there had been to, to date at that point, not much dendro uh, climatological work that had been done. There's been some proof of really nice proof of concepts work done in the 80s with regards to climate, been some archeological and historical dating. Uh, but that was challenging compared to other areas in, uh, in the Europe because there really wasn't the reference material. Um, and then a little bit of sort of forest dynamics work that had been done through forest research. So I set up the Scottish Pine Project. This was very much collaborative in nature. The, the initial focus was on climate, uh, but of course there was an ecological aspect there because of all the disturbance uh, that the woodlands have been going through. And then there was an archeological aspect because we wanted to date buildings. This is the link to the project website. And I started off with this slightly naive uh, idea of taking representative samples from every semi-natural pine woodland in Scotland. Now, there might only be 1% of semi-natural woodland remaining today compared to six or 7,000 years ago, but actually it turns out to be still quite a lot of woodland if you're trying to visit them all and, and walk or run your way through them. Um, and I'll show you a map at the end of how far I've got with that um, initial naive idea uh, back uh, 14 years ago. Now, the living archives, so the woodlands in Scotland, are actually restricted in length, right? Um, the average age of a pine tree in Scotland, uh, of in semi-natural woodlands at least, is probably between 200 to 250 years. There are older um, specimens, but on average, that, that is um, the, about the average length of the, uh, the trees, the age of the trees. So we needed to extend the living archive in some way, and I've already talked about the concept of cross-dating. So uh, we had this archaeological aspect in the project where we were starting to sample buildings and use material from buildings if we could date it to extend the living uh, archive. And then what became most important was the sub archive, um, and that was extracting stems from locks, lakes. Um, and I should just say now that we, we didn't focus on the bog pines at that time, but that is something that we're slowly moving to um, in the recent future. And the overriding aim as of sort of 14 years ago was to derive a long temperature sensitive temp temperature sensitive tree ring chronology for the Scottish Highlands. 
So just to sort of justify why this is important, um, this figure here represents the correlation of Braemar summer temperatures. So there's a long instrumental record from Braemar. Um, and then this is a correlation with gridded climate data, gridded temperature data for the whole of Europe. And you can see that Braemar represents pretty nicely, I mean, the correlations above 0.9 here, the, 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 the sort of summer temperature signal for much of the northern British Isles here. And as you get further away, of course, that correlation uh, and coherence decays with distance. Now, if we put onto that map other studies, tree ring studies that have reconstructed past growing season temperatures, so summer temperatures, then it, it is weirdly almost perfect around this sort of area of influence that we see um, here. So we've got the Pyrenees here, a couple of sites in the Alps, um, uh, um, Central Europe here, and then we get into the Scandinavian region here of Sweden, Norway and Finland over here. So these are all published archives um, and these are part of, these are um, published reconstructions of past temperature and they, these are part of an ever expanding network of long uh, 1000 years or longer in some cases uh, temperature reconstructions from tree ring archives for the northern hemisphere that colleagues uh, in Tucson in Arizona and I we, and many colleagues around the northern hemisphere have been working together to come up with large scale estimates of climate change uh, not just the big sort of time series but also spatial patterns as well so Scotland is just one small data point in this larger network okay and there are many groups focusing on to trying to develop these type of archives because they're profoundly important for understanding local scale climate change but also large scale climate change and the forcing factors that drive climate so if we go back to uh, the concept of dendrochronology when we go back to this aggregate model this conceptual model here what we want to do is we want to maximize that climate signal here and then we want to minimize these these the noisy signals the disturbance signals whether it's tree specific or stand wise so the sampling straight away has to be very strategic. OK, we, we, we don't go out into our garden and sample that happy tree in the garden, which is being watered regularly. It's in a nice deep soil, lots of nutrients, temperatures fine, plenty of moisture, you know, and there's no real var var variability in the ring sequence. We go to the environments where these trees are pretty much hanging on, ideally for dear life. You know, they're uh, thin soils up at tree lines where they're at the sort of boundary climatologically uh, where it's starting to get either too too uh, cold or too dry for tree growth or cambial activity to happen each year so it's the extreme states that ideally we want to head for okay now so that means growth ideally needs to be limited by one climatic factor and as a basic rule of thumb and this works throughout the northern hemisphere and for, for pretty much any tree species you want to to target is if you go up to the high elevation or the high latitudinal tree line of most tree species, then that tree line exists because the summer temperatures above that tree line, whether it's higher latitudes or higher elevation, simply become too cold for wood formation in the growing season. And so you get no trees beyond that limit. OK, so that tree line is important and is a temperature controlled tree line. So we get to that tree line and we sample the trees just below that um, and they generally are quite responsive to temperature. At the same time, if hydroclimate or precipitation is your is your climate parameter of choice, then you would go to low elevations or low latitude environments where you're getting to warmer, drier um, areas. So the American Southwest, Southern Spain, Morocco are all very good examples for these. And then precipitation, moisture availability is your primary control on growth. You can enhance the climate sensitivity in these archives as well is by also targeting um, extreme or ecologically extreme sites, ridge crests, talus slopes, where the, basically the soil quality is very poor and therefore growth rates are extremely slow. So um, depending on how well you know the highlands, if you go to Greenlock or the talus slopes in Glenfeshi, up into Allerdale, um, and the, in these environments, the trees are very slow growing, but very, very sensitive to, 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 to uh, climate change from year to year. So the great news is that Scots pine is a beautiful species to work with, whether you're in Scotland or going into Scandinavia and all even down into the Alps and so forth. It is very sensitive to, to temperature change when you're at high elevations. And in Scotland, through the work we've done over the last sort of 15 years or so, um, is that for most trees, most 
pine tree specimens that you sample above 250 meters, but getting up towards 600 meters, the, the sort of getting close to the true, true tree line, then you get a very nice temperature signal within these archives. Particularly strong in the density parameters in the rings. It is in the ring width as well, but it's really driven by the, uh, by the density data. And that's really what I'm focusing on in this talk. So, so the, the, the sampling is very strategic. Uh, and we can go to these environments, but what we need to do is minimize these tree specific um, noise factors and certainly stand wise not noise factors like fire and so forth. Now in Scotland, the biggest disturbance factor is man. OK, there's been many centuries of timber extraction. And if you go into a woodland and you remove, say, I don't know, 50 to 80 percent of your trees, then those remaining trees are going to go, whoa, whoa, wait, hey, look at all that canopy, all that space, all those nutrients. We're going to grow. We're going to grow quicker. Right. And that's great. The trees are happy. Those survivors, they'll, they'll, they'll have this nice pulse of release and they'll grow quickly for a while and then they'll start slowing down as the new uh, second generation or the next generation of woodland grows up around them. The problem is, is that release event is a real headache for the climatologist because that is a pulse of growth, a pulse of pro productivity, wider rings that doesn't represent climate. So the first thing just to get around the tree specific uh, noise is we just simply sample lots of trees. Um, and it is the norm nowadays is that for every site we sample, we try to sample at least 30 trees per site. Um, although I have colleagues where we sometimes we, you know, we've got some sites we've measured 100, depending on um, how many times we've gone back to certain areas. Um, and, you know, this is just an example of 10 trees here. Um, and the blue line, which is the average of all of these trees, that average chronology is the chronology time series that we would use then for the analyses. And we would truncate that at some point when replication is deemed too low to have a robust mean function. So 10 trees at least uh, is a minimum. For understanding the standwise signal, the only way to really get a good handle on exogenous disturbance is really to sample a network of sites. Um, and that was my primary aim at the beginning of the Scottish Pine project and we have we have basically sampled about 50 sites depending on how you define a site throughout Scotland. So here's just a bunch of time series for the sites going from the northern Cairngorms down to the south. So we've got Abernethy in the north here going all the way down to Ballackbury here near Braemar. Um, and these have been processed a little bit to remove age trends but basically you're seeing multi-decadal variability and year-to-year -year variability. Anything in red is where basically productivity or ring width is greater than average and blue is where it's lower than average. And because these have been sampled from so-called temperature limited environments, blue should denote cooler conditions and red should denote warmer conditions. And you could see throughout this network that there is clearly some pattern between all of these sites. You can see the 1880s and we could see that there was periods of cool or inferred cool periods around the 1800s and the late 18th century and so forth. However, within that, of course, every site is slightly different. Every site has a slightly different story. We could look here at this one here. This is from Rothy Mercus here. And here it would imply in the recent period cooler conditions. And actually what's happened here at this particular site, growth is suppressed related to past timber clearance and, and profound ecological damage in the woodlands for that region uh, at the time of when we were sampling and, and, and the, this time series I'm showing. Um, so this has been a bit of a headache, but when you have a network of sites, um, you can actually play, uh, I don't want to say statistical games, but you can use uh, multivariate methods to extract the common signal, which is the climate signal, and, and then the rest of it, the ecological disturbance, is then the noise and can if it be effectively averaged out or removed from the analysis. So very briefly, how do we take samples? Um, a tree increment core. Julia mentioned that I, you know, I go running around the mountains looking for trees, and that, in a sense, is exactly what I do. Okay, a core is about a standard core is 40 centimeters long. These are perfect for living trees. They can be used for historical beams in buildings, but that's only when the buildings are in good conditions. We can, of course, use a chainsaw. Generally, don't live, use them on living trees, but they're great for subfossil material. Um, here's just a, on the talus slopes above Green Lock here, a dead remnant tree just lying down. We could get a Take, quickly take a disc off um, and so forth. And then also if a house has been renovated, we can lop off the end of a beam that's been renovated and so forth. So, you know, it's nice to have a disc rather than a core if we can um, do it. 
But the tree increment core is basically our tool of choice. Standard example is about a 40 centimeter long handle. The borer bit will go inside the handle with the extractor spoon um, screwing in. So we can just put that in the backpack and literally walk through. Um, it will extract a five millimeter diameter uh, bore of wood from a tree. They can be put into a straw and then very quickly you can sample trees. So this is um, Coralie Mills. She's, she's a, a, a colleague of mine. She's actually a landscape archaeologist, uh, but dendrochronologist dating buildings. She's oaking. Uh, Okay. She is sampling an oak tree near Loch Katrine here. So actually this is a slightly larger 50, 60 centimeter core because it's a very large oak tree. You screw this core into the tree. You then put the extractor spoon into the bore of the borer. This then nips onto the sample. Um, you then turn the core back one, one turn and then you pull this, um, this, the spoon or the extractor spoon out and then you bring the core out of the tree and then straight away you have your first sample for the site and you could sample a tree very quickly as long as there's no rot and no difficulties and so forth you could probably sample a tree in less than five minutes and so you can imagine that you can sample 30 40 trees quite quickly with a cut two or three people at a site um, so it's, it's a really nice way of getting a lot of information very quickly so this map shows the Scottish Pine Network as of 2017. Now the dates are quite important and I put them in, you'll see why in a minute. Um, and so I had a PhD student working um, on what I call the first phase. We're now in the second phase of the Pine Project. But the first phase, um, uh, we had really tried to sample as representative sites throughout the available extant pine woodland across Scotland. We sampled roughly about 50 high elevation sites and I'm defining high elevation as above 300 meters. Um, and uh, you'll see that in the west, uh, I've lost my, uh, but the west here, we had a much sparser network relative to the Cairngorms. The Cairngorms was our initial focus. Most of the sites work very, very nicely in the Cairngorms and a lot of the problems we have experienced in the Scottish project had actually all been in the west. Um, two sites have trees that, that germinated or started growing in the 15th century, um, one in Glen Loyne on the west side here and then in, in Mar Lodge in Glen Derry. There's another one and statistically you can't actually tease out between the two sites of which is older than the other. I would say that the Glen Loyne site is not as healthy as the uh, Glen Derry site. The Glen Derry site, those old trees are, will, will still continue to grow for many years to come. Um, and they look pretty in pretty good state. The bad news for me as a climatologist is that almost all of these woodlands are in a state of recovery from intense timber extraction from the 18th and 19th century and even a little bit in the 20th century around the times of the First and Second World War. Um, but the, the, the early 19th century period actually was the most profound period. Uh, the Napoleonic War had a massive impact in many of the woodlands um, and especially in the West. Um, and it's one of the reasons why the West, we've struggled to get really good data from the West. But I'll show you the latest results here and we're, we're, we're moving in the right direction in, in trying to improve that. And then with regards to subfossil material, then the two regions of choice was the Northern Cairngorms. So that's Rothy Mercus through to Glenmore um, and into Abernethy and then Glen Affric. And Glen Affric um, has been a gold mine with multiple lochens, um, which are full, full of, uh, of remnant preserved pine material. So back in 2007, when I first started this off, um, I was told by the now head of school, actually, of geography at St. Andrews, ironically, he said it would not be possible to do what's being done in Scandinavia and find some fossil material in Scotland. And usually when someone tells me something's not possible, I will go off and try to do it. So I went off for a weekend with my son at the time, and we spent two days mountain biking from Glen Feshy all the way around to Abernethy, um, swimming in the locks, wading in the locks looking around and i wouldn't say everywhere we looked we found wood but in a lot of locks we found wood and this lock is a good example in fact this was one of the best locks in the northern cairngorms this is loch gowan or loch gamna depending on um, how, how how you want to pronounce the gaelic and this is in rothy mercus um, and this was really the first lock that really got me excited. There was wood everywhere. Now, clearly some of this, because it was at the edge, was from a recent felling event around the, the lock shore. Um, but in that weekend, um, I had a pruning saw and I took samples from multiple locations through the Cairngorms. I managed to get some funding through NERC to get the carbon dates for these samples. 
And at that time, I was just focused on trying to reconstruct climate for the last thousand years. I thought that was my aim. That would have been pretty cool. And when we got the results back, basically, we found that there were samples covering the full 8,000 years. OK, it wasn't continuous, but we had basically 50 percent of all. Now we've, we've dated about 53 timbers from uh, throughout Scotland, mostly in the northern Cairngorms. 50 percent of the material is from the last 2000 years. And then the other 50 percent of the material is then the preceding um, 6000 years. Um, going back to 8,000 years BP, um, which at the time, you can just imagine, I, I didn't just fall off the chair. I was just like thinking, oh my goodness, where do I start now? Because, you know, that suddenly got very complicated. So much of this talk is fo focused on the last millennium and there's still 7,000 years to work on. OK, um, and I'm running out of time. So just quickly, I talked about how we call a living tree. This is actually our process for sampling the subfossil material. So this is a GoPro image uh, that we set up uh, on some of the times we were doing some of our subfossil sampling. This is the Green Lock in Rive Owen Pass between Glenmore and Abernethy. It's a beautiful location. It's very un-Scottish, really. Um, you've got this beautiful pine woodland in the talus slope above. That's why there's such old trees up there. Very sensitive, very slow growing. And then the green lock itself is full of wood. Now, some of this wood has been brought down by uh, rock avalanches coming down the talus slope, but some of the wood is also related to previous shorelines. So we can see a tree here with the exposed roots here, but you can go a metre below here and there is another old shoreline and then there's trees that have died. At some point, the lock level has come up, the trees have died, they've collapsed in, and we can just go in and collect. So we normally have two people in the water here. Um, I think this is me. This is a Swedish colleague, Bjorn. Uh, and, and then to have two people on the side with the winch, we will then scuba dive, not scuba dive, we'll snorkel around, find a tree, try and put the, the grabber and the cable onto the tree. And then we would slowly winch this out of the sediments, cycling through here. And we bring it to the shoreline. And, and the problem with these trees is when they're in the water, they're sub buoyant and two people can move a large tree around, no problem. OK, as soon as you bring it out of the water, suddenly that tree is two or three tons because it's just wet and saturated. So we drag it onto the shore as best we can. We excavate underneath it so we don't damage the chainsaw and the gravels. Um, and then we do a cut as close to the shoreline as possible. I will say now that the, the chainsaw oil we use is peanut oil. So we try to do this as environmentally as friendly as possible. And we'll cut there, take our time, cut a disc off. So here's Cheryl just bagging up the sample here. And then the then the hard work happens because then to please SNH is we have to put the wood back, right? Putting that bit back, but then we have to drag this bit back and then we hide it into the water and so forth. So you can imagine that we were used to do this as easy. We used to do this sampling at the end of August when the kind of the sampling season opened up. If we did it earlier, we weren't allowed because of breeding birds and so forth. So we'd had this intense five to eight day period every August where we were going and we would be broken at the end of this period. It was just such exhausting work. Day one, we were all gun home and we were trying to get 30 trees. And by the end of day five, we'd be lucky to get 10 trees and maybe your backs are hurting and so forth. So anyway, between 2008 and 2017, we had sampled over a thousand subfossil trees. So we had about a thousand discs. So this is just some examples in our vehicles and so forth. You can imagine the labs back at the thing. My, this was my office uh, a few years ago. There was just wood everywhere and it smelled lovely. Um, unfortunately, we had a storage crisis. So all of these discs were then cut up into radius laps of wood and they're all now bundled in plastic bags so we can store them in these shelves that we have scattered them in my offices and down in the lab and so forth. But a beautiful archive. Um, and far from complete, I will say this now, you can actually see here, the preservation of some of this wood is not brilliant. Unlike Scandinavia, we have very mild winters. You might not believe it. Actually, it's all melting out here. I'm, I'm a penny cook here. We had snow and it's all melting. It's miserable. Um, unfortunately, in Scandinavia, you get these really cold winters and it preserves the wood very nicely in these sort of anoxic lake sediment environments. Where in Scotland, it's just that little bit warmer. There's a bit more vegetation in the lakes. So the preservation uh, is not always brilliant. So there is a finite amount of work we can do with this archive, I think, compared to Scandinavia. So the last year that we did any sampling was 2017. Um, and then um, we're going to move forward to 2018 and so-called status of the project. And there's a reason I, I did, um, um, 
using this date. So here we have just a, a histogram showing the number of trees on a number of samples. Um, and then this is focusing just on the northern Cairngorm. So Rothy Mercus, Fruta Abernethy. So the dark green here is lots and lots of living trees that we've sampled. These sort of paler green here is then the cross dated sub fossil material from the locks for all of that region going back to the, uh, just the end of the 12th century with a nice overlap with the living data so we can ensure we get this tight cross date. And then we've got these prolonged periods of material from the sort of uh, big third to the fourth century and then the sixth to the to the ninth century, 10th century and so forth, where at the moment they are placed in time through carbon dates, internally consistent, but still we haven't got a calendar date because we have this annoying gap uh, in the 11th, 12th century period. Um, now this was back in 12, 2018. Now in the August of 2018, I was approached by BBC Breakfast of all people um, because they wanted to film some dendrochronologists doing uh, subfossil sampling in, in the Highlands. And actually this was partly to help a new lab in Cambridge that was being developed at the time, but they weren't set up to do the fieldwork. So I was asked, so I got all the glory of being on BBC. So they came up, we organized, we had a couple of days sampling. We had one day of doing subfossil sampling. And if anyone has ever done any TV stuff here, it's just endless jibber jabber of them asking questions, the same questions, you answering it. They do it in different locations and they try and make everything look very nice. And at the end of the day, we only sampled one tree. Now, what was frustrating is back in 2018, we had had a very nice, dry, hot summer and the, the lock level, green lock. So we went to green lock because the visuals were so nice. The lock level was one meter lower than it normally was when we went sampling then. It was just so much more woody material that we could access. It was just lying there ready to go. We were like, oh yeah, we can sample this stuff, no problem. But the way TV works, in the end, we only sampled one tree. So what was the date of that tree? Well, just by luck, 985 to 1266. It overlapped with this period here beautifully dated it in and it filled the gap. What was frustrating is that I was bemoaning in the interview with the BBC of like, oh, we've got this gap, right? And it turned out that with the lock level being so low, we actually have the medieval shoreline and all the dead trees at that point. Unfortunately, since then, the lock levels have been back up and we have not yet been able to go back in because we've tried scuba diving and it's just too dangerous to do sampling and scuba diving in the way we, we would need to do it. So we're waiting for another drought year. Um, but anyway, this was great news um, and we are just waiting for a hot summer to go back and really fill in this medieval period here. Um, we took two samples, I should say, and uh, it even got to the red sofa on Breakfast TV where Dan and Louise uh, complained of how smelly it was because it had been in a suitcase for six weeks by the time it actually went onto the BBC. But there you go, that was the bit. I did warn them that it would start smelling. So anyway, so remember, I've been sampling in other areas, not just the Cairngorms. We, we've got a lot of material from Glen Affrig, um, and also historical buildings that we've dated in this project. So if we start lumping all that data together, so this is still a 2018 thing. I don't have the BBC sample in here, but we've got now more dated material in this period. Now we can see that the replication is vastly improved. Um, we've got a whole bunch of historic early material here. Uh, some of this is actually from St Andrews, one of the buildings on South Street. Um, and then we've got uh, lots of material also coming from Glen Affric. Now, what is interesting from Glen Affric is that the Glen Affric material is actually substantially older than the last millennium. So that's just material just ready to lock into this jigsaw piece uh, puzzle uh, in some uh, uh, future time. OK, so I've talked a lot. I haven't talked about climate. So let's have a look at the climate reconstructions. So uh, as part of Milos's PhD, um, we actually divide uh, developed two products. Um, we One that's really going to be the focus of the rest of this talk is what we call the extended reconstruction. So this was look, looking at all the living trees and the subfossil material from the northern Cairngorms, so Rothy Mercus right through to Abernethy. But we also used the whole network to come up with spatial gridded reconstructions from Scotland. Now this was more of an exercise to identify where the reconstructions were doing well and where they were failing. So anything in red or dark red here is where the calibration, the regression R squared values are well above 0.5. So we're explaining more than 50% of the variance. 
And so over the Cairngorms and even Southern Scotland, we do a pretty good job. Now, Southern Scotland is an extrapolation outside the network. But when you actually look at the West here, so really West of the Great Glen, then everything starts breaking down quite, quite horribly, to be honest. Now, this partly is because there were problems in the tree ring record. It's also partly probably uh, related to the instrumental data is not particularly very good because the, the rest of Scotland is focused on Aberdeen, Braemar, Edinburgh, Glasgow and so forth. And you get into the northwest of Scotland, you only have Stornoway and you have Lerwick. And really, they're kind of slightly coastal impacted instrumental records. And I think they're also impacting the instrumental data. So it makes it a little bit harder to calibrate. But anyway, just be aware that we've done those reconstructions, uh, but we're going to focus on the long term story uh, coming from the extended reconstruction. So this work was published in 2017. The actual data set was finalized for Milosh's PhD back in 2015. It was made up of 347 living trees from the northern Cairngorms and 109 sub-fossil tree samples at that time to extend the living archive. The calibration from this, so this is a multivariate mix of both ring width data and density data. Um, and you can see that the calibration, so in black is the reconstruction, in red is July, August mean temperatures, so summer temperatures, late summer temperatures, and the calibration is really very good. Um, even if you don't understand the R squared, at least the visual comparison of this is pretty spot on. Remember, these are trees. This is not thermometers. So, you know, there are other things that are impacting the growth of these trees. But you can see that it's actually quite tightly coupled uh, with the summer temperatures. And if we do a spatial correlation, so I showed you one earlier against Braemar instrumental data against Europe. This is the same of the reconstruction against the rest of Europe. And there you can see that the reconstruction does a pretty good job pretty much for the whole of the United Kingdom. Um, and again, it, that correl correlation decays as we go further away from the United Kingdom. So it's doing what it should do. Um, and it's a really nice, well calibrated reconstruction and is on par for most reconstructions um, around the Northern Hemisphere that has this amount of data going into it. And this is what the reconstruction looks like. So it goes back to 1200. Um, it is plotted here as temperature anomaly. So this is deviations in, uh, in, in degrees Celsius relative to the mean of the period 1961 to 1990. It's just a climate norm. Uh, just be aware that this variant of the, of, of the reconstruction has more uncertainty in, in many ways prior to 1550. And that's really just because we have less trees. Remember, we have 300 living trees at the recent end and only about 100 trees making up the pre-1700 period. So the replication is a lot less. Um, and, and then we're working on that to improve that in the, uh, in the future. And I'll very briefly show that um, as we come up to the end of the talk. Um, and you can see there are prolonged periods of cooling. These are in blue. We've got the warming pe um, period in the recent period that matches the instrumental data nicely. Parts of the 19th century were warm. And then you can see nuggets of warming going back in time here. Now, it is very likely that these periods of warming here are an artifact of the, the noisiness in the record. And I'll briefly talk about that. The warmer century is the last 100 years, 1911 to 2010. And the colder century is 1612 to 1711. The 17th century was a miserable period. That was not the century to be alive in Scotland. So, I just we don't have much time, so I can't really go. But this is a really, really rich archive of past climatic information. Um, and at the same time as we were developing this record, Alistair Dawson up in Aberdeen, who is a, a historical geographer, I guess, um, maybe a historical climatologist, he wrote this book called So Foul and Fair a Day, A History of Scotland's Weather and Climate, which details a profound amount of information from historical archives um, of Scotland, um, giving you an overview. But what he had, which was nice in that book, was particular years and periods that stood out in the historical archive as being particularly poor with regards to weather and how it impacted society. So. Let's focus on 1782. This is the coldest reconstructed year in our reconstruction. And let's see what Ali Dawson's book says about the period around 1782. Well, already in 1781, there was a poor harvest. So the year before was, was pretty poor. We had heavy rains and flooding in the spring of 1782. And there was a known famine year in 1782 to 1783. So there was a collapse in the agricultural system at that time, or it was crop failures. Um, so the Trimming Archive agrees very nicely with the historical um, uh, documents. 
And this was the year before Lackey in Iceland blew its top in July 1783, where lots of people died in Europe because of that sulfurous cloud coming down through Central Europe, around from France and up England back into Scotland. So again, a miserable year or two living in Scotland and Europe at that time as well. Now, when in 2016, when we had the paper was in review, I got an email from uh, Phil Jones at the Climate Research Unit in East Anglia. And he says, Rob, I'm reviewing your paper, like the paper. But did you know that there's an early instrumental data set from Gordon Castle? You should check, compare your reconstruction with these data. And then he attached those data in an Excel file um, to the email. Right. We weren't aware of this. Right? We had used the gridded data and calibrated back to 1866. Um, and that was the period where the so-called temperature data was deemed acceptable. So very quickly, this email came and I thought, oh, brilliant. Great. Let's do a comparison. And this is the comparison. Now, remember, this is completely independent to the calibration data set that we had. So the blue line is the reconstruction, the sort of NK, Northern Cairngorm reconstruction. And the red data here is the July, August temperatures from Gordon Castle from 1781 to 1820. And here's the coldest year in the reconstruction. And it matches, it matches perfectly with the Gordon Castle record. And we even see 1799. And we even see the Tambor year in 1816. It's actually stronger than the reconstruction than we'd see in the instrumental data at this time. But the match was beautiful, a really nice, completely independent comparison and validation of our model. So that was great. That went straight into the paper um, in, in, the, in the review of our paper. But what was interesting in our record is that I've done a lot of work and I'll very briefly talk about that. It just have one slide is that such treeing archives are very good at picking up volcanically forced cold years. So Tambora blew its top in 1815 in Indonesia. In 1816, we have global cooling, the year without a summer in Europe and so forth, we pick it up here. But the Scottish archive has actually picked up lots of cold years that don't coincide with known volcanic events. 1782 and 1799 is a really good example. So what we did is we compared these very extreme years with a pressure reconstruction done by climatologists in Bern in Switzerland. And we looked at the mean pressure pattern for these cold years. And what it turns out, so this is from 1650 to present, is that on average, when you get these extreme cold years, cold summers in Scotland, they are all related to a basically a prolonged low pressure system scenario based over just to the north of the North Sea, bringing down then cold air right down from the north across Scotland and into Europe. OK, so Scotland is a slightly bizarre archive compared to some of the more continental based archives, uh, to tree ring archives, which show very clear volcanic sourcing. It's here we get a mix of volcanic sourcings, but we also get this dynamical cold years related to this low pressure system that keeps once in a while hitting our uh, climate and causing us to have a miserable summer. So it was a dynamically interesting sideline to the study. So if we go back to the reconstruction, well, this comes to the nuts and bolts of the thing. The coldest decade in the reconstruction is the end of the 17th century, it's 1695 to 1704. Now, this is a well-known cold period. I mean, we haven't we weren't the first to discover this in any way, but we were the first to put it in the context of the last 700 years or so. OK, within that, 1698 is the second coldest year in the reconstruction. This period is well known to have been cold globally related to multiple tropical volcanic events. Hecla also blew its top in Iceland. We also had the so-called Mondo Minimum, where the sun was in a slightly quiescent phase at that period. And so the global patterns of cooling are quite strong and profound in the 1690s. It just happened that it was more severe in Scotland than certainly eastern Scotland. It's actually less severe in, in Western Scotland, interestingly, but certainly in the Cairngorms, this was a really cold period. So 1694, this is well known, was the first of seven years of crop failure and famine across Scotland. This were known as the ills. OK, um, and a quote from Ali Dawson's book from the unfortunate year 1694 till 1701, the land seemed as if struck with barrenness. And such was the change on the climate that the seasons of summer and winter were cold and gloomy in nearly the same degree. So not much different to what we have at the moment, I guess. No, I'm just being joking. So this was a thoroughly miserable period. OK, climatologically driven. It's also at the end of a very cold century as well. 
OK, we must remember that this is not just a one off decadal period, that there was this was a prolonged period of cold conditions in the summer. The Treeming Archive is the summer. That's the growing season. So you need to think in those terms with regards to agricultural productivity. So if we roll back now to 2020, just over a year ago, we published what we jokingly called the Brexit paper. Um, and I, I have uh, no excuses for the, the contention that this paper might cause or have caused. Um, and the title was Complexity and Crisis, the Volcanic Cold Pulse, Cold Pulse of the 1690s and the Consequences of Scotland's Failure to Cope. Now, before, luckily, none of you can start shouting at me. Um, the, the message, I'm not even looking at the messages. This was a paper that we really wanted to talk about a very severe period climatologically um, for, for Northwest Europe, but also geopolitically, it wasn't a particularly good time for Scotland either. OK, and this whole period was kind of the end game of a, of a very long 17th century of cold conditions, um, political crises with England. Um, and, 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 and the paper really focuses on the complexity of all the different parameters. It's not a, a, a deterministic paper and say when climate's cold, everything's going to go to pot in your culture. It wasn't that kind of paper. And it was really we were focusing on the complexity of all the different factors that could lead to a culture that struggled. Right. So what are our basic uh, conclusions? So from the Dendro archive, the 1690s, the coldest decade in Scotland for the last 750 years. Uh, and this was basically driven by volcanic eruptions. So that was the sort of climatological science. We had, I should say here as well, that Patrick Klingel here and Timothy Newfeld were two historians we brought in here. Patrick had spent about eight years of his life going through the Scottish archives, so knew a lot about the economic history um, um, and the arable and the agricultural history of Scotland and was focused on these kind of periods. So the historical archives, the 1690s was likely the worst era of crop failure and food shortage and mortality ever documented in Scottish history. It is estimated that 15% of the Scottish population died at that time, right? 15%. Now we're in the middle of a global pandemic. I'm giving a talk from my home office here. At the moment, 0.1% of the Scottish population has unfortunately died. But imagine 15%, right at the end of a period of prolonged coldness, misery, political and all that kind of stuff. It, it must have been horrible. So, and then, you know, when we, when you look at the wider European picture, some of the other European countries weren't impacted. England, for example, wasn't as impacted by the 1690s cold event. France wasn't so bad. Finland was, Finland had a bigger die off than even Scotland. And part of this was poor agricultural practices and their, how basically they weren't very resilient for these big climatic hits onto the system. And there was also a lack of, uh, of food aid and, and movement of that. There was all sorts of political stuff at that time. Further to all of this, though, the, Scot the Scottish government at the time had set out to try and set up a colony in Central America. This was the so-called Darien expedition. Now, this was just a disaster almost from the beginning, but it was something the Scottish people had invested in, not just the rich. This was everybody across from the poorest to the richest. It was sold as this is the way of Scotland to get out of this woes. We're going to invest in this trading post to bring, you know, material, you know, uh, um, as a trading colony between the Pacific and the Atlantic. And we're going to Scotland's going to be rich. It's going to be as, as strong as, as England, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Of course, the Spanish didn't help. Dave didn't want it. The English weren't very helpful. The Dutch weren't helpful and so forth. And it was always doomed for failure from the beginning. Now, about two and a half thousand colonists went down there. Most of them died or those that didn't deserted and managed to escape up um, and out through the isthmus. The, the resupply ships from Scotland didn't come because of all the famines of the ills, because they weren't even allowed, they couldn't even supply resupply ships. So the whole thing was just just a miserable period. It's a really interesting read, to be honest. Now, in March 1700, the Darren, Darien colony was finally abandoned. But the implications of this attempt to colonize in Central America was that about one third of the Scottish wealth disappeared into this venture and finally crippled the, the Scottish economy that ultimately would have led to the Union a few years later. And this is the bit where 
you know, this is the, the end of Scottish independence. We had the ills, we had the Darien colonies collapse, Scotland's subsequent economic depression really motivated the scholars. They had no choice, really, but to join the United Kingdom. It had been something that had been debated for decades, but they, the Scottish had been brought to their knees. Not all parliamentarians at the time voted for it, okay? Even today, it's very contentious. Okay? Let's just talk about this. But it was thought at the time that it was the best and only way for Scotland to be financially, politically, and socially in a better position, okay? And it was thought that they would benefit from in England's international trade, political strength, well, its social structures and systems and improvement of agriculture systems, which had certainly helped England in the 1690s because it had, but, but really had not been impacted so far. So we finished the paper with a contentious statement basically revolving around that maybe smaller states were more resilient as part of larger economic unions. Hence why we called it the Brexit paper, because actually we really were trying to make a little bit of a political statement because it, we started writing this paper before the Brexit vote um, and so forth, but unfortunately, but I still think personally that it might be relevant for Scotland. However, this is a political hot potato and is not the aim of this talk. However, this week on Andrew Marr's Start the Week programme on Monday, there's actually a really interesting debate on Scotland and the Union talking about this period of the 1690s and the implications of this period. They don't talk about the climate impact and how that might have had a bit of an influence, but they do talk about the woes of the 1690s and then how that led to 1707 and so forth. So that's really the end of the nuts and bolts of the science. But what for the last few slides, I just want to highlight what's where I'm going and what we're doing at the moment here. So this picture here is the picture of what I think is the oldest pine tree in Scotland. This is in Glenderry uh, in Mar Lodge. Um, and actually it's a very healthy tree for its age. Um, and uh, the first ring we measured is 1465. So probably gen germinated around the 1450s. It's a beautiful, beautiful specimen. So as I said earlier on, Scotland is really a, a small part of this bigger mosaic climate jigsaw, okay? Um, so this is this network that we, we published a few years ago. Um, and all of these are similar data sets that we've developed in Scotland, done by many different groups. Um, and when you composite these together, you average out that kind of regional climate differences and you come up with the large scale climate change. OK, so we have composited this data set and this is a northern hemisphere reconstruction of summer temperatures using this record as 53 records. Um, and it's it's a really beautiful archive. OK, I put it together. I'm not being biased here, but it's just it shows that when you get good quality data and you put this together, you get a profound picture coming through here. So you can see the warming, recent global warming coming through right to present, looking pretty scary. Coldest period in the early 19th century. This is the Tambora volcanic event and so forth. And then you can see that the prolonged medieval period was warmer, but probably not as warm as it is today and certainly was prolonged. But there's a lot of variability through that period. OK, and in fact, throughout, as we drop into the Little Ice Age, there were these pulses of coolness in and out and in and out. So climate's changing all the time. and It's very variable. So from this work, we've been able to attribute uh, with colleagues of Edinburgh and, uh, uh, um, and elsewhere the main drivers of climate. And the most interesting thing for me and certainly the work I've been doing in the last five years or so is the influence of major stratospheric volcanic events. And you can see that all of these little cartoons here denote major volcanic events. Most of them are tropical, but some of them are mid-latitude, northern hemisphere ones as well. And you can see that all of these cold periods are tied in and coupled with cold conditions. And you might get a cooling of around half to one and a half degrees, depending on the strength of the volcanic event. And then the cooling will last for anywhere up to three to seven years, depending on uh, uh, on the period and how many volcanic events there's the double, you can get these double events as well that can cause a prolonged period of cooling. And, and the really exciting thing at the moment with regards to this is, well, you know, let's not put a downer on the whole thing, but after 40 years of climate scientists saying that carbon dioxide is bad for the environment uh, and it's going to drive, you know, through the greenhouse effect, warming conditions, and we can see this going right through to the present, there is no evidence yet that carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is reducing. There is just no, no slowdown. A little bit of a slowdown because of COVID for four months. And then China started emitting even more afterwards to catch up, right? So 
if that does not, if our mitigations of carbon dioxide emissions don't start slowing down, we at some point, the warming is going to continue. And at some point, we've got to we've got to put the brakes on the system or it's going to become very serious. So we know volcanic events cause a global cooling. This is the spatial reconstruction from the tree ring archives of 1816, the year without the summer. So very cold in Europe, but also in the polar Urals, northeast North America, not northwest North America. In northwest North America, it was 20, uh, 1817, which was the cold year. It took a year's lag. So this is where we may have to start thinking about really geoengineering our environment. Again, another contentious. This is a crazy answer to try to slow down global warming by injections of stratospheric aerosols like volcanoes, but directly into the stratosphere that will force the climate to cool for, for however long we put this stuff in the thing. Now, this isn't science fiction. This is science that is being done and tested. We're not doing it yet in the environment. We're waiting for the next volcano. But this is something that could be employed in the future to help slow down the warming while we, tr while we try to mitigate the emissions of carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere. We still need to suck this stuff out as well. I mean, it's just staying up there for, for, for many centuries. So this is where updating these networks is really important because we have actually a really good data set, as I show you here. But actually, before 1200, we start losing the information. The records aren't as good. They're not as well replicated. There may be more, more use of ring width data rather than density data. Density data is the, 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 pra the parameter of choice. And we need to push this back into the, the first millennium AD and because there's, of course, volcanic events back there as well. So we can get a better picture of how much sulfur we need to put into the atmosphere and how much that would lead to a certain amount of cooling. So we need to push these records back in time. So therefore, of course, I'm working in other regions in the Northern Hemisphere, but the, Scot the Scottish project is on the back door. You know, there's, there was a, there was a there's a lesson here maybe as well. I've worked on the same region for 13 years. The normal three or four year funding cycle doesn't allow you to do this kind of detailed study. So it's great. It's just up the road. Three hour drive. I'm, at, I'm in Abbeymore, you know. So where are we at with the network? So this is uh, the current thing. All green dots here are all pine woodlands that we've sampled. And there's been a substantial update in the last five years. And then all the red dots are actually sites that theoretically we could uh, sample if we, we wanted to. But you can see now we've got a lot more sites in the West. We're really trying to improve the Western side. We've got this beautiful data sets from Glen Affric here that we haven't really been able to use now uh, up to now because we've been so worried about the problems in the West because of timber clearance and so forth. So this was the reconstruction from Milos's uh, uh, study in 2017. Uh, just lumping all the data here, we've already come up with a preliminary update. And notice there's no real change in the last sort of four centuries or so. But when we go prior to 1550, remember when I said it was uncertain, then actually by adding a lot more data from Glen Africa and other areas, we've depressed a lot of these warmer inferred periods and actually the whole area. And this actually agrees much better with the historical record from the archives as well. The 1500s were not deemed as a warm period, as actually was deemed as a relatively cool period. So this is not published, it's not ready yet. We've got a couple of years of work here. We're measuring new wood anatomical measures here to help en enhance the archive. Um, but and now with the so-called BBC sample as well, we really want to get into the medieval because it is thought that the medieval should be probably warm. One of the reasons we have a gap there is probably because it was warm. The preservation of the wood material in the locks environments was not as good then as it was in the Little Ice Age. All right. So still early days, but an update is, on, is ongoing. So this talk, I've really only focused on the last millennium, and yet we've got this potential jigsaw of an archive that goes back 8,000 years. So I'm really excited. I've got a new PhD student starting in September that's going to be focusing on the so-called pine decline of around six and a half thousand years ago, but also four and a half thousand years. Multiple phases of pine decline in the highlands known from pollen archives, but also the peat bogs. So we're going to go in and we're going to do dendro on both the bog and the lake material to try and get a, and we're going to focus on that early period in the early Holocene of about four to 7,000 years ago to try and get a better understanding of what was happening. What was happening with the climate at that time? Also, we're looking at sort of DNA and fecal matter within uh, a, a core stratigraphy and pollen records to try and understand if there was a shift 
from natural herbivores to domesticated herbivores that that would then indicate the man coming in and colonizing and therefore probably removing forest at that time. So really excited about that. So decline is really important. OK, and we need to understand about pine decline because then that starts coming about how what's going to happen with the pine trees in the future. OK, it's going to get warmer, it's going to get wetter and so forth. So this is some ongoing work, uh, a, a little bit preliminary, but the results are really good. So this is uh, basically the new updated data just for Cairngorms. So the Cairngorms as a whole and the rest of the Western network. This is the density chronologies calibrated against, in this case, June, July, August temperatures. These calibrate the Cairngorms is even is sub substantially improved with the new data. 68% of the variance explained, but even the Western network, 56% of the variance. And this is calibrated from 1900 here to 2000. And you can see even in the 19th century, the correlation is very good. So this is great. This is what we want to do, because what I'm trying to do now is try to understand the variability and the productivity in these trees and model it. And what is the drivers of it? Because then we can look at the model predictions of warming and, and moisture and so forth for the future and see what may or may not happen with these pine woodlands. I mean, these are beautiful woodlands. We want to preserve them when we need to manage them. The problem we have in our updating is when we actually look at the very recent period. So this is now the same data from 1950 up to basically the present 2017. The Western trees and maybe even the Cairngorms, so the, the Western trees are crashing. We've noticed this in the field. You, see, you, you take the core out of the tree, you look at the rings, and the rings get wider all the way up to 2000. And then that last decade, the rings are super, super tight. We've seen it in Glen Nevis, Glen Affric, Glen Loy, Coda Glen, Rodoric. Um, and we don't understand what it is. And this is not a systematic problem of, of the, the type of sampling or the density or the ring width. This is a real signal that we're seeing in many of the sites. So we're actually now starting to sample in the Cairngorms where it's drier, just to get an idea is, is this something that's purely stronger in the West where it's wetter, windier, stormy and so forth? Or is it something that we're seeing over Scotland? At the moment, we don't know. But this is the sort of deviation. This, these trees, the first time these trees have decoupled from climate since at least 1780 because of the Gordon Castle comparison. So this is, a friend of mine said it was the Rob Wilson effect because we'd started coring the trees in 2010 and this is all the trees are dying because we've been coring them up. But it isn't that, trust me. Anyway, my final slide. We really have a good, quite a good understanding of temperature changes for the last millennium, both at local and larger scales. With a couple of years work, we can get the full millennium Scotland. I'm, I'm quite um, sure about that. Notice I haven't talked about hydroclimate in Northern Britain at all. We've done some work with oak down in Southern England about 10 years ago, but in Scotland, it's all wet. The trees are not limited by, well, if anything, they might be limited because it's too wet. Maybe that crash in the pines is that. So we're trying to start uh, getting some funding to do oxygen isotope measurements in the pine archives, plus oak as well, to see if we can come up with past precipitation and reconstructions for Northern Britain and Scotland. That would be really important to know what's, you know, what was happening in the 1690s with hydroclimate, no one knows. What we can say is that extreme climate states do have impact on society. OK, the 1690s is just one of many examples and there's plenty of studies and it's not just climate leads to societal collapse. There's all sorts of, uh, of, of geopolitical problems involved in all of that. But we do know that a, a, a warm or a, a changing climate state, an extreme climate state will put pressure on society. And we are entering a warm state. It might be a bit slower in Scotland, but there are other countries where the rate of warming is much greater. OK, I'm doing work in the Yukon and Alaska and these trees up there are struggling because of thermal stress. It's basically getting too war warm. The, the tundra is melting. Look at the Alps warming. Summer warming is accelerating and it's the, the, the woodlands suffer. So Scotland is warming, but we luckily are buffered at this moment. Um, and really what I am now shifting to is really trying to focus on how potentially the pine woodlands could respond in the future. OK, it is going to get warmer. It is going to get wetter and it's especially going to get wetter in the West and it's probably going to get windier. Um, and we are now shifting to trying to model the forward time. You know, you know, we need to know what these trees could do in the future so we can help better manage them. Maybe when we're planting and trying to regenerate these ones, especially if we're trying to sequester carbon by planting trees, we may need to sample uh, plant the trees in drier sites. But at this time, who knows? But that is the focus of our work now.
And I think on that, I have lots of people to thank for over the years. This hasn't been a one man band. Collaboration, being part of a wider group is always a good thing. Um, and thank you for your attention. Hopefully you all there still. Sorry, it's gone over time. Well, thank you very much, Rob. Um, we've had about more than 70 people attend. I'm not quite sure why I'm getting feedback at present. Um, OK, and there's a few questions come in uh, wide ranging. So um, now let me just have a quick look through them. Now we had a question early on from somebody who asks, what was your career path? <laughs> it, it, it's somebody who's in their last year at high school and they oh, right. want to become a scientist working on something to do with climate change. Um, so they'd be interested to hear how you got to where you where okay. you are. There was a very long answer to that, but I'll keep it short. Um, uh, I come from a medical family. Everyone in my in my family are doctors and nurses, um, and I didn't want to go that way. So I actually I went to university to become a geologist. Um, so I, I was very much into physical geography uh, at school. Um, went to Durham University to become a geologist, and I hated it. The irony now is I'm director of teaching of a geology department, but I'm not a geologist in any way. So I did my geology degree, didn't do so well, ended up in Tasmania to do glaciology in Antarctica. And while I was doing that master's, I met a dendrochronologist who was based from uh, Columbia University. And then I've worked with those people ever since. Um, so I got into the tree rings by leaving geology to go into glaciology but then meeting dendro people and then I was just fascinated with trees. So I was my first study as a technician was in Tasmania building a 2000 year chronology and that was almost from living trees, the, the, the hue and pine and it's one of the longest living trees in, in, in Australasia. So that's the short answer to a very long convoluted route. Um, but I, I'm, I'm a physical scientist. Um, but if any of my colleagues are watching, I'm a failed geologist, but I, I'm a climatologist now. <laughs> OK, and the same person later on is asking uh, about what journals you publish in. They'd like to follow some of this up. And I'm just wondering whether you could give us an extra PowerPoint slide that we could put up on our YouTube site um, and then they could go and have a look and pick yep. up on things from there. Early on in the uh, I think uh, you can actually just um, if you Google um, uh, St Andrews Tree Ring Lab, that will take you to the website and then there should be a link to publications and then all my publications are there and I illegally have put links to all the PDFs. So, but you know, so, you know, there's, you know, Holocene, there's a, there's a few nature -y type and science papers in there as well, but there's a whole bunch of uh, uh, stuff. So that's probably the easiest thing, but yes, I can give you a slide with a link as well. I think in this talk as well, early on when I talked about the Pine Project, there's a link directly to this project website, but I, I've done studies, uh, we've got ongoing projects in, in South America at the moment and Australasia um, and, and across, of course, Eurasia and North America. Actually, most, a lot of my work is actually mostly in North. I started my dendro career with my master's in North America, actually. Um, so we have these projects from British Columbia right up to the Yukon and Alaska. So there's a whole range of papers from all over. OK, great. Um, and somebody else is asking if you could write an article for them, but I suppose there the best thing is for them to follow up on your departmental website and get in touch with you that yeah, way. Email me, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we're we're um, very expensive as academics, you know, it's a thousand pounds a word, I think, now. <laughs> um, OK, now we're coming back to uh, some of the practicalities. Uh, when you were talking about how you took the course, um, and I was amazed how quickly you could do some of them. Um, somebody asked, how do you sort of close the hole and protect the tree after you've taken the core out? So what you mustn't do is put anything in the hole, right? Because you're actually pushing a foreign object in. The trees are amazing at healing themselves and, and the core really damn the, the core bit so that the actual core we take out is about half a it's a five millimeter diameter core, wood core and the bore ahead the, the actual screw thread is about eight millimeters so it puts about a centimeter diameter hole through the bark through the cambium into the xylem into the wood and you extract it now as long as you're not sampling in the winter where the tree is basically not really doing much it's in sort of a dormant phase but if you're in the spring and the summer 
it will very quickly fill the outer hole with sap. And then after about one or two or three years, the bark and the tree will naturally close over the hole. So the tree will heal itself. Um, it, the green lock is a very good example. If you're ever in the Highlands, go to the green lock. And if you're careful, go clamber up on the talus slope there on the scree. And then on the upslope side of all those trees are huge scars because rocks are coming down all the time and hitting these trees. And some of these rocks are embedded in the trees and the trees are growing around the rocks. So trees are wonderful. At basically, you know, like humans, if we cut ourselves, we'll grow over in a heel. Trees will do the same thing. So a core hole is the tree is only alive on the outside, just under the bark. You get this thin layer called the cambium, and that's the living bit. The wood inside is basically just where it puts all its rubbish, essentially. So it's quite resilient. So that hole will always exist within the tree, but the tree will grow around it. So from a timber quality point of view, the wood can get a little bit discolored. If you came along and cut the tree down 10 years later, there might be some discoloration around that borehole. But in the semi-natural woodlands of the of the highlands, I don't think anyone's really cutting those trees down. So um, but if you if you're in a, in a plantation and you're coring and that's for timber for furniture, then you need to get permission. You get, need to put, get permission anyway, I should say. But uh, but it doesn't damage the trees. The trees will naturally close over the holes. OK, now uh, Amelia asks um, how working with tree ring archives compares with working with coral archives? Uh, well, OK, so that was I, I forgot. To, <laughs> so my my I did have a, a brief uh, dabble for a few years when I was a postdoc in Edinburgh back in the mid 2000s, working with a guy called Sandy Tudhope. And I have never sampled a coal head ever. I was basically the data monkey and they would give me the data, the oxygen isotopes and the strontium and calcium. And I was doing all the analysis, working with the coal archives. And actually all I was doing was applying dendro methods and approaches to the coal world and the coal data sets. So I've never, bar a bit of snorkeling at one point on a holiday, I've never actually, so I don't really call myself a coal person. Just conceptually from a statistics point of view, they are annually dated just like trees are. Um, and, and just like historical archives, you have this very high resolution archive from coals. Coals are beautiful for the tropics, there's no doubt about it, but I couldn't tomorrow get, a, get in a boat, go to the tropics and be able to sample a coal. I'll have to be honest about that, but I can play with the data. <laughs> <laughs> OK, now coming back to pines, uh, Maria asks, um, says that she's seen pine remains poking out of the peat in Rannock Moor and wonders whether you've sampled those and of course um, you see you see trees in ireland as well although yeah. they may be oak rather than uh, pine well, you maybe. Get, you get old pine in, in 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 ireland as well so um so no i we the at the moment the fog pines are a different beast right so at the moment we're essentially sampling mineral soil pine trees well behaved you know um when you get into the bog pine environment the pine trees are very slow growing the, the roots are basically sat in a very PT saturated substrate, which pines don't really like. So they grow very, very slowly. So the climate signal in the way that I've been talking about in the last hour is not the same. Uh, it's very complex, much more complex. Um, so that's the first thing. So we have we have some of those green dots in that map I showed before are some bog pine sites because we are moving into going into the bog pine environment but i've purposely kept away because it's a very gnarly archive having said that there is lots and lots of potential because the bog pine environments represent an extreme marginal environment so if there's a subtle change in the climate the bog environments will be impacted first before the lower elevation mineral soil sites so we are as i said in this september i've got this new phd student starting um, and we are going exactly into these environments. Um, Rannoch Moor is on our list. The Karua Estate, which is actually part of Rannoch, um, are very excited. They've even given us some money to do carbon dating on. on so, so what we want to do, though, is we're not sampling just random pieces of wood, which you can see everywhere. We are trying to find bog pine sites where there is a profuse amount of old woodland material. And a good example, if everyone ever wants to get on a mountain bike, is go from Rothy Mercus up into Glen Einick and just down the valley from Loch Einick is a big, big washed out peat hag and there are thousands, well hundreds maybe, 
but certainly hundreds and hundreds of pine stumps. And they're all six and a half to seven and a half thousand years old. There's a whole forest there just waiting to be played with with a chainsaw, basically. Um, it would be great if they, if they ever allowed me up there with a JCB, it would be a lot easier, but that's not going to happen. But to go up there, we've at the moment, we've gone up on mountain bikes and band saws and taken some samples, but you can actually take a four wheel drive up into Glen Island quite easy for Rothy Mercus. Um, so that's exactly where we're going next. But but we're going to be doing pollen archives in the peak deposits as well, because um, the, it's not a continuous record in the bog pine environments as we see in the mineral soil sites in the lakes. Um, but that's for the future. That'll be for the next talk in five years time. <laughs> OK, now Max has just told me that he thinks we might get cut off in about five minutes, but there is a good question to end on because you've obviously sparked these thoughts in lots of people. What are some careers related to climatology? Ooh, uh, that's, a, that's a tricky one, isn't it? <laughs> well, you could become an academic, but um, I've, I've had students who have, they work for the Met service you know, the meteorological service down in Exeter. Um, uh, I don't know, if, uh, the students who go, go go through our university go for a, a sort of a range. You know, we've got geologists through to environmental scientists. So some go to SEPA, uh, some work for SNH, um, you know. So, yeah, I mean, that's the, the world's your oyster in a way. Um, I, I've never had a job in my life. I'm an academic. <laughs> so, so I'm not the careers advisor here. Um, <laughs> Um, no, but seriously, um, you know, the meteorological services, if you want to do, you know, meteorology and, and climate, that's very much, uh, you know, you can even, we even had one student a few years ago who became a BBC weather presenter, um, when I, you know, so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's tricky, actually. I mean, I, you know, I've never thought of it in terms of that kind of job, um, but, you know, come to our careers page. I'm sure we have information about such jobs, uh, but environmental science, I, I, I would say that the most important thing is actually data analysis is a very transferable skill. So it doesn't matter if you work with climate archives or, you know, aqueous geochemistry or, or something like that. They're all quite transferable. So getting those general skills and, you know, I was taught as a geologist, but then shifted over to climatology. You know, the skills are useful across the board. Well, thank you. And just in case we do get cut off. Um, thank you. It was a tremendous stimulating and informative talk and I think the sorts of questions that we've had tonight show that you've caught the imagination of quite a few people in our audience and um, uh, by the way Jonathan has put up a link to your St Andrews page on the chat. Um, now uh, so I'd like to thank the audience who've come tonight in particular and asked so many interesting questions and Rob for all his work putting together this really great talk. So, sorry it was a little long. Well, fascinating. <laughs> I don't mind. Um, and if people want to start or want to watch, sorry, miss the start or want to watch again, they'll find it on our YouTube site in a few days, just when we downloaded it and tidied up the start and the finish. So thank you to everybody, uh, our audience. Good night and thank you for watching. Thanks very much, everyone.